Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to actually uh, start before I start by reading a uh, passage out of the Bible. And contrary to what I just said about needing to find down your own, I'm going to tell you what this one is. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting about halfway through verse 16. We're going to go 16b through 18. 2 Corinthians, that's the one in the New Testament. It'll be about 90% of the way back in the book. 16. Starts right in the middle. It says, as God has said, I will live with them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Well, grace and peace to you all. Grace and peace be with you. I am Lieutenant Roger McCourt. I am at the Salvation Army's Napa Corps, and this is our weekly time of worship and study. Uh, now, for those of you online or on video, when we get to meet in person or in a more interactive format, uh, I do generally begin by assuring people of two things. Uh, first, I guarantee that you will learn at least one new thing from or about the Bible today. Amen. Absolutely guaranteed. And if I fail to deliver on that, I expect you to call me on it, and I will reward you by teaching you at least one new thing you've probably never known or heard from the Bible before. So far, this has been a promise I have always been able to keep, so I, I'm always uh, interested to see if people challenge me on this, but uh, we'll, we'll see. Second thing. I usually try to assure people is that their questions are welcome here. Um, it can be really hard to address everyone's on and off topic uh, questions as they just come up during a message time, especially in a recorded session. Um, but I am always open to people seeking more information. Um, and your questions about where or how I come up with the thing that I said that's bugging you, or your question in general, or your question that has nothing to do with anything we're talking about, um, those are all great. Maybe not during the sermon, but I'm happy to take all those afterwards. Uh, and you can always post questions or comments wherever we post these messages or email me at roger.mccord at usw.salvationarmy.org. And of course, for those of you online, if you can hit like or subscribe, all those things help us and they help keep you connected to what we do and say here as well. But enough of the broadcasting details because they're not very exciting. Um, let's get on to something more interesting. This is Father's Day weekend. Amen. Happy Father's Day. How many fathers here? Happy. Quite a few. I had a pastor friend last week who asked me who the uh, who I thought the three best and three worst fathers in the Bible were, and that's because they were putting together notes for their own sermon. And I thought, what a great idea! I'm going to steal that. Uh, but my answer to them was that just like in modern life, there are way <coughs> more terrible fathers in Scripture than there are good examples. Here in the Salvation Army, we tend to work with people who are broken or who are recovering from being broken, and a lot of the time that means that they don't have great parent histories, um, either with the parents that they have or as the parents that they've been. Uh, for some people, even just acknowledging a day like Father's Day can be this terrible, hurtful thing because of their experience with fathers or their experience of what being a father was like is just so, so broken. And I, I feel like I need to mention at this point, my dad rocked. And that's not to rub that in on anyone who didn't have that, but my dad, uh, he wasn't perfect, but he was closer to it than I am, I'm afraid. Um, so, Dad, if you're watching, happy Father's Day. I, I do love you. Um, and I'm very grateful that God saw fit to put me in the family that he did. Uh, I have known and experienced through uh, other friends and relations a lot of not good fathers. And so I know how, how precious it is that I had such a great one. Um, but there we go. I mean, my dad did a great job, and I'm hopeful that I am at least okay. But some people's dads were just bad or, or absent or worse. And that's kind of just the way it is, right? But if we just left it there, that would be really depressing. So we're not going to leave it there. One of the most powerful images in scripture is this picture of God as father. 
And if our view of fathers is broken, then how are we going to ever find a way to relate to God? There's a picture of God as mother in scripture as well, and it is also really powerful, but it can be just as problematic. Um, and also, in our kind of misogynistic Western faith world, uh, that image tends to be obscured so often. A lot of people don't even realize that God as mother is a thing. They just think of God as father. But that's a whole conversation for a different day, maybe Mother's Day. Today, we're going to start with the Bible's unflinching look at the reality of bad parenting. And then we'll see if we can find some good examples that we could actually learn from. And maybe that'll help us decide whether viewing God as Father is valuable, or if that's one of those things that we need to just get rid of, throw in the trash. So in my search for bad dads, this is actually probably the most depressing part of this, I didn't have to look very hard. Uh, one thing the Bible is really good at is showing people for what they are. And well, most of us have our shining moments of greatness, I hope. You know, the truth is we all make decisions that suck more than a kid trying to drink a milkshake through a paper straw. It's just not good. Even the best and brightest of men in ancient scripture seem to have struggled to be fathers. Uh, take a look at Abraham in Genesis. He's uh, the so-called father of the faith. And you'll see a guy who child services would have been all over if he lived in modern times. He was a terrible father. It started even before his first child was born. He and his wife then had kids. They followed this custom of their time. She arranged for him to impregnate her slave girl. But apparently that's not a good way to fill the home with harmony. And as a result, the two women started sniping at each other. And Abraham gave his wife permission to abuse the slave which very quickly drove the pregnant woman to run into the desert to escape. That's in Genesis 16. I see a couple of you trying to keep up there. It's only because God rescued her that she returned to the tribe. And when the baby was born, that baby was Abraham's son Ishmael. Abe, he seemed to improve as a father. And for a while, anyway. But as soon as his first wife, Sarah, gave birth to Isaac, Abraham declared that Isaac was his only legitimate child, and he turned Ishmael and his mother out into the desert again. And God rescued them from certain death out there and set them up in a nearby country. But, man, you think you've got abandonment issues. Imagine that you're, you know, 16, 17 years old, and your father's like, well, you know, for the last 17 years I've told you you're going to be the heir, but, you know, I've decided I like your brother better. Get out. And you'd think that having disposed of that pesky extra child with the other woman, Abraham would now be a father devoted to his remaining son. But no, and only one chapter later in Genesis 22, we find the old man bringing his heir up a mountainside to become a human sacrifice. Well, I got rid of your brother. <laughs> Lay down on that wood pile, will you? Again, we got God intervening. He saves the day. He saves the child. And that's as far as most people know about Abraham's story, but honestly, he's not done as a father yet, as a bad father. Uh, news of his attempted filicide, remember that word filicide, that's the, uh, the word for a parent killing their own child, filicide, uh, it's going to come up again in this, sorry. News of his attempted filicide, it gets back to his wife, who uh, she either died from shock at the news that he had tried to sacrifice their son, or she moved away and died shortly afterwards. That's in Genesis 23. And then Abraham married a young woman who popped out six more kids for him, one right after the other, in Genesis 25. And as they grow up, he sends them away to the farthest lands he knows and disinherits each of them as he does that, uh, even though he's given them you know, traveling money. Yeah, well, son, you're, you're 14, now you're threatening your older brother's inheritance, so here's 20 bucks, go catch the bus out of town. What a great dad. Abraham was not father of the year. If you were going to learn what kind of God, what kind of a father God is from the kind of dad that Abraham was, you might think that God is someone who would choose a favorite child and send the rest away. But fortunately, that is not the kind of father that God is. Now, Isaac, Abraham's son, demonstrating that he learned his habits from his father, Isaac also played favorites with his kids. He had uh, just two. He had twin boys, Esau and Jacob. But Isaac loved Esau more than he loved Jacob. And he told him. 
he worked very hard to make him the tribal leader over his brother. And finally, he ended up sending Jacob away, knowing that it was unlikely Jacob was going to come back before Esau inherited. That's uh, Genesis 25 through 28. If you were trying to learn what kind of God, uh, what kind of father God is from Isaac, you might think that God is someone who, who only loves one of his children. Fortunately, that is not the kind of father that God is. Jacob, meanwhile, he took the favoritism of his dad and he took it to a whole new level. Jacob had four wives and 14 kids, but he really only loved one wife and the two boys who came from her. There was no question about who his favorites were. In one instance, in Genesis 33, he actually divided the family up into uh, different spots in a line so that if they were attacked, the ones that he loved would escape and the rest of those kids could get killed off. I mean, <laughs> can you imagine lining them up? Okay, Reuben, I need you to go in the front of this line because, well, you know, those guys over there, they might kill us. So I need you in the front and... Uh, Joseph, I need you back here with me. His daughter, Jacob's daughter, was raped by a villager near where they were keeping their herds. Jacob did nothing about it. He openly favored Joseph and he gave him valuable gifts that he withheld from the others. He let everyone know who his favorite was. And at the end of his life, Jacob called all of his sons to him. And he let them know all the ways in which they had disappointed him and why he was elevating some and putting others down. And he unloaded anger and bitterness that he'd been carrying with him for years on different of his sons for the things that they had done that he hadn't bothered to say anything about at the time. If you were going to learn what kind of a father God is from the kind of a father Jacob is, you would assume that God is bitter and angry with you for your past mistakes. Fortunately, that is not the kind of father that God is. Skip ahead a few generations. We find this guy Jephthah in the book of Judges. He made a foolish promise that he was going to sacrifice whatever came out of the front door of his house. Um, now, to be fair to him, the way their houses were built, the first thing you had when you went in the door was a little area holding pen where you kept your animals. So he probably assumed the first thing that came out was going to be like a sheep or a goat or something. Turned out his beloved daughter is what came out of that door first. And so being a loving father, instead of saying, oh, whoa, I didn't mean to kill a person, he, he said, oh, you've got two months to get ready for this, and then I'm going to burn you as a sacrifice. Yay, Dad. <laughs> if you were going to learn what kind of a father God is from the kind of a father Jephthah was, you would assume that God was a rash and unmerciful person. Frankly, also, you'd have to assume that he's not too bright. Fortunately, that is not the kind of father God is. How about David? You all know who King David is, right? Israel's greatest king, before Jesus anyway. He was known as a man to be after God's own heart. So maybe he was a great father. Mm, no, no, hardly. Uh, David has a list of dad fails that's longer than pretty much anyone else in the Bible. Um, among his biggest problems was one of his sons raped one of his daughters, and he knew about it, and he still did nothing. And then one of that daughter's brothers set up the man who raped her, and he killed him, and David still did nothing. Then that son exiled himself for a couple of years, and David did nothing to reconcile that situation or somehow try to put his family back together. He just ignored the whole situation. And as a result, that son rebelled, and David's advisors were finally the ones who had to put an end to that son's illegitimate reign. They, they kind of took him off in a corner and stuck a sword through him. But later, David chose to favor another one of his many sons, a guy named Adonijah. He favored him over all the others, and he allowed and encouraged really spoiled behavior from this kid right up until that son tried to take over the kingdom for himself. And then David was confronted by an earlier promise he had made that his other son, Solomon, would get to be king and so he installed Solomon as heir and again tried to just ignore what Adonijah had been doing. If you were going to learn what kind of a father God is by what kind of a father David was, you might think that God was someone who did a whole lot of nothing about anything. Someone who didn't care about justice. Fortunately, that is not the kind of father that God is. 
And then we go a little farther in scripture. We get to guys like Ahaz and Manasseh from 2 Kings. They ruled uh, two generations apart. Um, Ahaz was the grandfather. Manasseh is the grandson. And each of them brought grief to Israel by doing the same things. They, they rebuilt pagan worship in the, in the country, including building all these shrines and hilltop altars and bringing trees in and decorating them and worshiping them. And they did all this in an effort to get the attention of false gods. And one of the things that they did as they rededicated their country to pagan beliefs is they each took a son, their firstborn son, and sacrificed him to Molech, the god of fire. Molech was uh, generally worshipped by building these giant iron altars, demonic-looking statues, and they would build a fire in them in the belly of the statue until it glowed red and then white hot. And where the hands of the statue were, right above that opening, people would bring and they would set the child right in the hands and it would actually burn and melt into the altar. What a great dad. If we were to think that we could learn what kind of father God is from these men, we might think that God is cruel and vindictive and treats the lives of his children as if they're worthy only to be traded away in an effort to receive some benefit for himself. Fortunately, that is not the kind of father that God is. Now, that is seven really quick examples of bad dads in the Bible. And as much as I hate to say it, I have known dads who fit just about every one of those descriptions. I mean, the ones I've known may not have literally fed their kid into a fire like Ahaz did, but I have known more than one who might as well have done that when you consider the ways they burned them on the altar of their addictions or their insecurities or their own selfish grasping needs. None of these are good examples of how we should choose to live. And it was hard for me to narrow it down to seven. So if you're looking for examples of bad dads, just open the Bible. You're probably going to find one, wherever it is. If you're looking for a good example of the kind of father that we're told God is, if you've had any image of God that matched one of these guys or someone like them, it probably just wiped that good example out. huh? So what we need are good examples we can follow. Maybe examples that we could actually learn what it means to be a father. Maybe examples we could learn what kind of father God is to us. Good news, I was able to find a few of those in the pages of my favorite book here as well. I'm going to start with a guy you may not even realize was a father. Job. You all know Job. He's got a whole book in the uh, First Testament named after him. Um, most of that book is filled with whining, complaining, and people trying to prove that someone else is a bad person. But before all of that starts and all of the trials begin, Job was a thoughtful and prosperous family man who lived a righteous life. In uh, Job chapter 1, verse 1, it says, There once was a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz. He was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil. Now, before you think, yeah, blameless, uh, let me explain. Blameless does not mean that he lived a perfect life. It means that he did his best to keep his attitude and his actions consistent with what it meant to be part of God's family. Job was a guy who made mistakes, too. He made a lot of them. In fact, you read through his book, he makes a whole bunch of them in there. But just like you and I make mistakes, um, it happens. And then what he did, he would go pick himself up, ask for forgiveness, and carry on. Which is what you and I should do also, just if there was any question there. Um, that's what it means to be a man or a woman of integrity. It means that you pick yourself up, you refocus on where God is, and you head that direction. right? It probably also helped that Job maintained a healthy respect for God, and he stayed away from evil. Because what you associate with is what you become. Right? So, at Job was also a father. Verse 2 in Job chapter 1 says he had seven sons and three daughters. And I can tell you that he loved his children very much. And I can tell you that because even though they don't get much time in this text before they're wiped out, also a terrible story, um, we can tell from what we do know about them that their father cared for them. This is verses 4 and 5. It says Job, Job's sons would take turns preparing feasts in their homes. And they would also invite their three sisters to celebrate with them. 
And when these celebrations ended, sometimes after several days, Job would purify his children. He would get up early in the morning and offer a burnt offering for each of them. For Job said to himself, well, perhaps my children have sinned and have cursed God in their hearts. So this was Job's regular practice. Just, he didn't know, he, he just wanted to make sure that his kids were covered. Just in case something had gone wrong, something had happened. I have known a number of people um, over the course of my life who tell me that their lives have been changed by a, a praying grandmother or a praying aunt. How much more powerful is it when a parent is devoted to praying for their child and willing to give of themselves to assure their, their well-being? I mean, this is making sacrifices for 10 kids. That's no, no little thing. I mean, we're talking he's bringing 10 animals, and that's a substantial investment. At any time. Job, though, he was a good and a faithful father. He didn't just commend his children to God. He actually paid the price in case they, they had sins that needed to be covered. He actually paid that price for them, as far as he was able to. And he trusted in God. He made these great sacrifices for them, and he prayed that they would succeed in their lives. That's a good father. In the tragic story that follows, he loses all of his children to a natural disaster that just it claims all of their lives. And his pain is like this raw wound that hurts us to even look at it, but he carries it openly because he loved his children so much. And they were torn away from him. They were cast into death, but he's just... You read through his book, he's just bleeding pain about the loss of his family. Some fathers who suffered a thing like this might become selfish and grasping, and if there was any new child or a person who came into their lives, they might become clingy, trying to hang on to that kid like they're a precious keepsake, wrap them in bubble wrap, keep them safe from everything in the world. That kind of father might never let another child even go out into the world for the fear that they might lose them again. But not Job. Job still strove to keep his children, all of them, free from anything that might keep them from realizing their potential. Because at the end of the book, his children, I'm not going to say they're replaced, he has more children at the end of the book. Um, in uh, Job 42, verse 13 through 15, we read this. It says, God gave Job seven more sons and three more daughters. And he named his first daughter Jemima, and the second Keziah, and the third Karen Hapuch. <laughs> Which means a beautiful thing, but I would hate to name my kid Hapuch. <laughs> In all the land, no women were as lovely as the daughters of Job, and their father put them into his will along with their brothers. See, Job, not only did he care for his children, he actually elevated them, he set them up as equals. That's not normal in his time. Rather than playing favorites like a bad dad, this particular faithful father recognized that every person is a beloved child of God who needs to be given the same rights and responsibilities to care for the land and the community that they're part of. The good dad. Another example of a faithful father is Joseph, the man who took on the unenviable role of raising God's son as his own. Talk about a job you don't want to mess up. <laughs> uh, God, about, about your son. Um, yeah. Even before Joseph knew his role, he demonstrated he was this man of integrity and caring. He, he found out Mary was pregnant. He knew it wasn't his kid. And he could have been absolutely horrible to her. He could have made her an outcast. He could have had her driven out of the village. He could have had her taken out and stoned based on the, the laws of the time. But instead, he was gentle and he was respectful toward, towards her. When God spoke to him, he listened and he followed God's word instead of doing the things the world might have encouraged him to do. Even though that result brought undeserved shame on his family. Because everyone else also knew Mary was pregnant and for him to go ahead and marry her meant that he took all of her shame that people assumed she had and he brought it into his household. He respected God's plan so much that he avoided consummating his marriage until after Jesus was born. He still raised the boy as if he was her own, as if he, yeah, as if he was his own kid. That's amazing, especially in that time and place, even if you accepted someone else's child into your family. To raise them as your own, that's a whole different level of commitment. Joseph made great sacrifices for Jesus. He prayed that he would succeed in life. 
Joseph, who was even willing to become a stranger in a strange land in order to protect them, he was willing to uproot himself and marry and head out of the country. They went to Egypt. Egypt was not a kind place to be if you were a Hebrew, a Jewish person at that time. Joseph showed what it meant to be a spiritual leader to his family, and he did everything he could to point his family to God as well. And he cared deeply for Jesus as his own child. He was willing to go any distance to make sure to keep him safe. If you're trying to find where all that is, look in Luke chapter 2. Rather than seeking uh, his own elevation by sacrificing his children, Joseph is someone who trusted in God and sacrificed for his children. One more example of a faithful father. And this one's a favorite of mine. This guy named Jairus. Jairus was one of the leaders of a local synagogue. We know that he was married, and we know that the two of them had at least one daughter. And we know that because the girl got really sick this one time. In fact, she got so sick that everyone knew she was about to die. And Jairus, looking at his poor dying child, left her. He, he saw her, and he just left because he knew that his only hope was to get to the one person that he knew could do something to help, and that was Jesus. So he, was, he tore himself... I, I, it is really hard to do this. If your kid is sick, to just turn and walk away to try to get help for them, knowing that you, you're not going to... Eh, man. But in Mark chapter 5, we read about how Jairus went to Jesus, and he said, Jesus, please, my daughter is sick. Come, come and take care of her. Help, help heal her. Um, and we know that Jairus, he was a patient person. He was not demanding or abrupt. Um, even as he's bringing Jesus back to help, they were interrupted on the way back. There were, first, there were these crowds that kept pushing in around them, making it hard for them to walk, so they couldn't get anywhere. And then uh, there was this woman who like snuck through the masses and touched Jesus' robe, and then there's this whole thing where they had to stop, and Jesus is like, who touched me? And then they go through this whole thing where she's unclean, and then Jesus heals her, and then by the time he's done with that, Jairus, who's apparently just stood quietly, politely waiting for the healer, he gets messengers who come and say, stop bothering Jesus. Your daughter's dead. It's too late. Jairus, he just kept his cool through all these challenges, which I, I can't imagine that. Last summer, this particular week, my daughter Tamison had an accident in a pool. She inhaled water into her lungs, and, and she drowned, uh, resulting in a hospital stay and real risk to her, her life. But I had to be somewhere else. I had to, I couldn't, I couldn't be here. So she's getting breathing tubes and IVs and I'm like nearly frantic through this whole experience and even just thinking about it, kind of, I get all, I can't, I just don't even want to picture. But Jairus didn't do that. He trusted, even in the face of what he had to assume was disaster. Because after all the interruptions and these messengers arrived and said, stop bothering Jesus because the girl was dead, Jesus said, don't be afraid. Just have faith. And so Jairus did. And he kept that faith even when they got to his house. And the people were there mourning the death of his child. It even says the professional mourners had arrived, which means she'd been dead for, for a long enough time that they went out and hired people because this is what you did because you it was hard to express your own grief because they hired people who would come and grieve. The, like... Uh, uh, I've got some Irish heritage, and in my uh, Irish tradition, uh, we'd hire keeners, people who would come, and their job was to stand out in front where people were mourning and to just scream their pain up to the heavens. And I'm not going to do it because I'd probably blow the microphones out. But it's just this really high-pitched whine, screaming, ah, please, God. And it's just it's just a way to share the pain when someone is has passed. And when they went into the house... Jesus said, don't worry, she's just sleeping. And the people who were in there, they start mocking him and yelling at him, cursing him. But Jairus remained faithful. And so Jesus, he took the two parents up to see the dead girl's body lying on the bed. And Jairus was still faithful. Now, I'm not suggesting that he was convinced that Jesus was going to be able to do anything. In fact, the story suggests that he didn't think Jesus could do something at this point. Because dead, I mean, we all know what dead means, right? Dead means they're dead. They're not coming back. It's over. That's it. And Jairus knew that. 
And when Jesus reached down and held the lifeless hand of his daughter and then said, little girl, get up. And then she actually got up. It says in all three accounts of this, it says that the parents were astonished. They were shocked. They couldn't believe that this had just happened. They had no idea how such a thing could be. Jairus didn't know, but he had trusted anyway. Bad dads always seem to put themselves ahead of their children, but faithful fathers always seem to put their trust in God, and they show that by putting their children in God's hands. God's going to take care of them. They put their children ahead of themselves, even when it involves making sacrifices on their behalf. What about Jesus? Jesus is God's son, right? A lot of times we get distracted in the story of Jesus by the, this uh, idea that we uh, tend to share as, as pastors because we like to oversimplify things. We like to say, well, God sent Jesus to die for your sins. Well, what kind of a dad is that? Hey, those people are bad. Go die for them. That, that doesn't sound like a loving father. But what can Jesus teach us about our Heavenly Father? Well, when the disciples asked Jesus to show God to them, Jesus said, well, if you knew me, you know God. Not me, him. If you know Jesus, you know God. Because Jesus and God were the same. Jesus is God. Jesus is the creator. Uh, John chapter 1, that's the, what the, the author of this gospel is trying to get across. And he says the word was God and the word was with God and he was with God in the beginning, and all things were made through him. He's trying to get across this point. Jesus and God, they are one and the same. Jesus is the creator. Jesus is the heavenly father in human form. Jesus cared for and about all of his children, by which I mean every human being. Jesus shows us how to be a good father to those children. We are told again and again how Jesus trusted God in all things, and we see how he sacrificed himself for his children, all of his children, even us. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world so much, he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus trusted in God and he sacrificed everything for us. Jesus is the ultimate example of what it means to be a faithful father. Jesus is also an example that we can all follow. Trust in God, sacrifice for others. If you do the one, you're going to do the other. Ultimately, what does it cost us to do that? Trust in God and sacrifice for others. What do we give up when we look out for people around us the way that God looks out for us? Put it another way, Jesus in Matthew 16, 26 says, What do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? What is giving up something that God has created so that you can do what God has asked ultimately mean? Who owns all this stuff? God. If it belongs to God in the first place, if he chooses to give us back to us, then he does. If he doesn't, that's fine. Right? Is anything worth more than your soul? Today is Father's Day. If you are a father, reach out to your children. If you're a child, reach out to your father. If you're a mother or you have one, you can do the same thing because fathers are really happy to share their day. Doesn't matter if you're male or female. Today and every day, you can always be a faithful father to the people around you. All you need to do is follow that example set for us by Jesus and by every other faithful father who has come before us. Trust in God and love others. Even if it means you need to sacrifice a little something here or there, it's all worth it. God promises. This is one of those parts that's a little awkward with the video. I always have notes at the end of my, my messages. It just says, altar call. Look, I have an altar. You can call it. <laughs> the, 
idea of bringing yourself forward in a church setting and presenting yourself to God at a, a prayer rail like we have here, or altar like we have over there, um, or uh, doing something, I have no idea what you would do at home, kneel at your keyboard, or pray at your computer. Um, the idea is just an idea that you are presenting yourself to God and saying, God, from this moment forward, I'm going to try and do things your way. And for some of us, that might be a prayer we need to repeat over and over and over, because every day we need to refocus a little bit and try and get ourselves back where we're going. For other people, it's like a once-in-a-lifetime thing. I brought myself to the altar on July 3rd, 1974, and met God there, and uh, ever since then, we've been best buds. <laughs> Most of us, it's kind of a process. We work through our salvation. However you need to work through your salvation, let me invite you to do that. If that's by coming to pray here, if that's by praying at your keyboard, if that's by just taking a moment, taking a deep breath, connecting with God and saying, I'm going to point myself towards you. Amen. Let's do that. I'm going to close us with a uh, word of prayer. Father God, be an example for us. Remind us of the example you have been for us. And remind us of the examples of good fathers and, and good moments in uh, our, our own experience of fathers. None of us gets this right all the way the first time through. Help us to learn how to take the mistakes made by others, the mistakes that we've made, and learn from them so that we become the people that you created us to be. Lead us closer to you in all things, Lord, as we, uh, as we look for a path. Help us to always just try to keep our eyes focused on you. Thank you for providing the example of Jesus so that we have someone who was human, who's gone through all the same trials and struggles and challenges that we have, who can understand the, the pain that we have felt and show us how to, how to move on, not to leave that behind, but to bring it with us, to incorporate it into our lives and to become better people because of our experiences. Lord, as uh, we move out of this place today and into the world, I ask that you would uh, remind us of your presence. Wherever we go, Lord, you are there and we have nothing to fear. And I thank you for that. Help us remember to rely on your strength when we don't have our own, to rely on your courage when we don't have our own, and to trust in you as our ultimate father in everything. We pray all this in the name of that same Jesus that you sent. Amen. 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 I just remind you one last time, 2 Corinthians 6, 6, 18, God said, I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters. Go out of here, sons and daughters of God. Grace and peace to you all.